Hi, welcome back to the gun range. The uh, where we speak about everything firearms related live on local television. If you have any comments, questions, suggestions, if uh, for what we talk about, you can always call in at 508 266 0990. And if you're more of a text texting type of person, you can always text my cell phone at 508 three four one one two six nine this week we have a, a returning guest i'm very excited about um a gentleman by the name of christopher pinto hi how you doing today? Hey, richard how are you Thanks i'm doing great back. thank you uh chris uh takes care of mass gun rights and um a uh, company that uh will not uh yield on anything with our firearms laws and uh hopefully with his help we'll be able to regain some of these these rights that we have lost over the last few years chris tell me uh what what's up with mass gun rights well for, first i gotta apologize it seems every time i come here it rains the last <laughs> time i was here was in like january or february there was piles of snow on the ground and it was raining yep. and then you invite me back on again and like clockwork. It I, I heard Grafton got three and a half inches of rain. Yeah, it was, uh, my phone was going off today with fl flash flood warnings. But yep. Yep. Uh, th thank you for uh, having me back on. Oh, so pleasure. We're, we're going into an election season at Mass Gun Rights. Yep. And uh, this is where we try to do our best work. Um, uh, we're a 501c4. So we're involved in educating uh, voters about their choices. Um, we use Facebook ads, mm -hmm. emails, uh, robocalls, and things like that to alert people to get out and vote um, when there's a race where we can make an impact. Um, so we've made an impact a couple times already. Mm -hmm. uh, we helped uh, get people out to vote in the Dean Tran election. So basically, we're not allowed to tell you who to vote for. Mm -hmm. We're not allowed to tell you who to donate money to. But... We know who our audience is, and we educate them on this person is pro-liberty mm -hmm. and freedom, meaning pro-guns, and, and pro-self-defense, however you want to look at it. And this other person is a clone of Healy. So you're just and educating so the people with facts. We're educating the people with facts. We mm -hmm. send out um, questionnaires to the candidates, and we'll be sending out quite a few questionnaires later this week to for the candidates in the upcoming elections. Um, and we help to recruit candidates as well. Excellent. Get them trained, um, vet them. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to keep them on course because, uh, you know, when they when they get um, they get up there on that, in that Beacon Hill swamp, they can easily be swayed to, ah, don't worry about it, this is a good bill. I mean, let's talk about ERPO, for instance. The... Emergency Restraining Protective Order, as it's called, also known as a red flag bill. So a lot of people don't really know, like, the inside baseball of what's going on. So let's try and go over a little bit mm -hmm. of it for you. And uh, a shout-out to our friend Jared Yanis. Mm -hmm. Jared um, runs a YouTube channel called Guns and Gadgets, right here in Massachusetts. And what Jared does is he has people in Washington, all these different people that tip him off all the time. And he's really plugged in. He's got quite a network. Um, so he knows about what's going on in other states. Usually what's going on in other states, you'll see it coming here. Now, Jared did a, a, an episode of his video blog or vlog, I don't know what they call him on YouTube, his, an episode on his YouTube channel back maybe about a month or two ago that tied all the money together in, in where they're pushing this red flag uh, ERPO bills. 
and all the money's coming from a one Michael P. Bloomberg. What a shocker. Yeah, who's also known as the godfather of gun control. He also funds things like Moms Demand Action. So if you push Michael P. Bloomberg's agenda, then when you go out on a campaign trail, if you're, say, one um, tyrannical attorney general in Massachusetts, you are flanked by Moms Demand Action shirts because they're to support you. Oh, you're doing the right thing. Oh, we love you. Thank you. Thank you. I call that group Moms Demand Disarmament. They are mm -hmm. the most uninformed group of people on guns and self-defense that have ever drawn air. It's incredible. Now, so in Massachusetts, the ERPO bill was supposed to be a mental health bill. Now, if you know anything about what happened in 2014, they wanted to put a mental health component into the 2014 gun bills, and they got huge pushback from the mental health community, from the medical community. They don't want you stigmatizing them. Mm -hmm. You know, let's not take someone's rights away because they are struggling with, with depression or anxiety or something like that. And it's a tough, it's a tough problem to deal with. So what ended up happening in the end is they stripped everything to do with mental health out of the bill. Now, some of the debate was ridiculous. I watched all the debate when it was in the House. And a one Shauna O'Connell, who's a great person uh, fighting against corruption in the welfare system, she got up there and argued that, hey, these are serious charges. You know, you folks pretend like if an ERPO is enacted on you and your guns are taken away temporarily, that, you know, as soon as you're past this struggle in your life, you're just magically going to get your guns back. Uh, here in Massachusetts, where your rights are decided upon by your local police chief, good luck with that. Because the police chief doesn't want to have the liability. Right. Unlike the judges in Massachusetts who set criminals free and don't seem to care. But that's, a, that, that's another thing Look we can talk about. Look at the drunk driving about. thing. The what? The drunk driving thing. If you got caught drinking and driving 30 years ago. You don't, you can't, you can't have, a, you can't exercise your rights. Yeah. It says the Second Amendment shall not be infringed. And these folks think that they can add stuff to it. Like, unless you got arrested for drunk driving 30 years ago. Or you're a 40-year-old guy, and unless when you were 16 you got into a fight and got arrested because of that fight. When you were 16, you should now, you know, not be allowed to own a gun at 40. Right. Uh, a lot of this stuff, if anything ever goes on a record, um, if you've ever had a medical marijuana license because you had an issue, now you're never going to own a gun in, in the state of Massachusetts. So they do everything they can to take away your rights. Now, a little bit more inside baseball. Our governor, one Charles uh, D. Baker the fourth. Okay. He received maximum donation just days before the 2014 election. His lieutenant governor received the maximum donation, which at the time was 500 And the Massachusetts GOP, the state party, received $5,000 just days before the 2014 election. Why just days before the 2014 election? Well, that would mean that it doesn't show up on a pre-election campaign finance report. Because those are due, like, I think it's like, October 19th, everything up to October 19th has to be included. And they, it's the pre-election report that gets filed. And, uh, you know, getting donations from one Michael P. P. Bloomberg, the godfather of gun control, just days before the election isn't going to look good. Then um, two years later, in 2016, our, our esteemed governor had a malformed idea that if he was going to get behind a ballot question to 
<clears throat> raise the cap on publicly funded charter schools that he would attach his name to that and then he would actually as a narcissistic guy that he is he'll do commercials for it now you think about it the uh, left controls the teachers unions how easy is it to attack a rich white Republican who wants to change the way the schools are funded yep. if he had any smarts and he, he, he's not a dumb guy but politically, I don't think he's all that smart at times. He would have hired little Asian, uh, Hispanic, and children of color actors from California to, you know, have a tear running down their face. <laughs> Forget about the logic. People, a lot of people in this state, they vote on emotion. Oh, knee-jerk reaction. I, Let's I get some little kids crying and yeah. say, I just want a safe learning environment. Yeah. I just want the same opportunities as the other kids and run the ballot question like that and pull on the heartstrings and make the teachers unions look evil because they don't want they don't care about these children and what they did was they easily made it look like charlie was going to destroy the public schools i was always for uh charter schools i'm for choice but as soon as he got behind it i just it was, i wasn't for it anymore yeah so during that campaign michael p bloomberg gave two donations to that ballot question, one for $250,000 and one for $240,000. So now, uh, Michael P. Bloomberg has given to Charlie Baker causes $496,000, just shy of a half a million, right? Now, we have this character locally who runs this group called stop handgun violence you ever heard of this john rosenthal yep if you look up in the uh campaign finance reports over the last few years john rosenthal has given it's either five or six thousand dollars to charlie baker he's given more money to charlie baker than is given to any democrats uh so now we're talking a half a million dollars sent baker's way whether it's the ballot questions and if you look at these ballot questions, man, they're full of all their friends are like executive directors of this and that, getting paid huge consulting fees, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're making good money. Everybody's having a good time off these corporate donations from Bloomberg and the rest of them, lining their pockets. And it's good stuff. But if I were to speak like david hogg does and i never would thank you we got to keep the show clean but if i were to speak like david hogg i would say well look at all the money that charlie baker got from the gun grabber michael bloomberg doesn't that make charlie bloomberg's well the word rhymes with itch <laughs> okay doesn't that make him exactly. bloomberg's yeah. itch follow the money follow the money follow the money so the reality of gun control it's it's yeah follow the money so article six uh clause two or paragraph two however you want to look at it it's called the supremacy clause in the constitution and it basically if you interpret it literally and we should uh it says that all state uh gun laws are illegal because the this supreme law of the land is the constitution this is Massachusetts. We don't do gun, uh, don't do constitutional rights here. Come on. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, me too. Well, it, it's our own fault for voting in all these people. I never voted for any of them once. And, you know, we let our friends vote for them. We let somebody vote for them. And that's why mass gun rights is here. We we want to get people educated, get them woke up so that they don't uh, vote for these folks anymore. In fact, uh, there's a couple things going on with mass gun rights right now that'll benefit your, your um, viewers. Excellent. Uh, if you go to massgunrights.com, there's a menu item, menu choice that you click on, and it says free sticker. And we'll get a free sticker out to you. There's the sticker. It's a five by five, what they call a kiss cut sticker. So that sticker is cut 
around the printing. So the white background there, it peels off of that and you stick it on your car, your car window. It's a great sticker too, high quality, uh, high contrast. I have a few myself and uh, very, very well made. They're not gonna fade on you. Yeah. They're not gonna peel off on you in a month or two. Or... Yeah, we hit the jackpot when we found this company to manufacture them for us. They're uh, <clears throat> company, I think, is out of California, but their manufacturing is in uh, Schenectady, out the Schenectady, yep. New York area. They're very easily recognizable, too, from even a distance. So when you're driving along, you can go, oh, there's one right there. There's a brother right there. You yeah. know, they're, they're great stickers to get. So you go to that. free, too. Wink, yeah, wink. you go to that website. You sign up for our email list. That's the only thing you got to do. Sign up for our email list. We'll let you know about uh, things going on. Um, you know, we'll ask for your help in different ways. We'll be looking for volunteers and donations and stuff like that. But we are a 501c4 nonprofit. Uh, we're not tax deductible. We're probably at some point we'll start a, a C3 and there'll mm -hmm. be tax deductible gifts that can be given to us um, by our richer friends who are looking for tax deductions. <laughs> uh, and we also are giving away uh, in our independence giveaway, we're giving away a six-hour ah. P320 Nitron in 9 millimeter um, with nice. uh, night sights, two mags, and a holster. So this is a sweet little gun. Uh, to get entered in that contest, you just go to Mass Gun Giveaway, M-A-S-S gungiveaway.com and it'll bring you to the page where you sign up to win. Who wouldn't want a free gun? And all you have to do is just sign yeah. up. Charlie Baker. Ugh. When he debated uh, when he debated Mark Fisher, they asked him about guns and he says never had need for one. Never wanted one. Charlie Baker said. Charlie Baker, yeah. Yep. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Charlie Baker, I don't think he'll be signing up for uh, to win a free gun. Uh, no, because the 50 bodyguards he's got already got a half, <laughs> half the arsenal of Massachusetts in him. We have, we have a phone call coming in right now. Let's see here. We're going to go this one. Uh, Did you lose him? Did we lose him? Hello, you're on with the gun range. Hello. Hi, how are you? How you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. Listen, my name's uh, my name's Mike Albert. I'm calling from Central Massachusetts, and uh, I just wanted to, to touch base with about. I've been I got involved with uh, I met Chris about a year and a half ago, and uh, I was tired of donating all my money to the NRA and Goal and a lot of these other groups that were sending our money, you know, taking it out of state and um, you know. I tell you what, they don't make him any better than Chris Pinto. You know, I just I want to wow. vouch for him. <laughs> Thank you, know, Mike. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, know, you. All this money, this guy, the the, the time, the energy, the resources. Um, you know, he's he's been able to to uh, really get involved in elections, and I think people would be well, well served to think about you know when they write that check to the NRA. You know, where is the NRA when we uh, when we where's the battlefield? You know, where's this money going? Chris is putting all this money back into Massachusetts, and um, I just wanted to thank Chris for everything he does. Thank all you, the time. Mike. And, and, you know, it's a big commitment. I just wanted to yep. come on and thank Ma him. And Mike's a big supporter. Thank, you, thank you, Mike, and thank you for the kind words. Yeah, brother. thank you for calling in, sir. Is there anything else you want to say? Chris, we'll talk soon. All right, all right thank terrific. you, Mike. Right, Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, he's got Mike has some great points there. Um, you know, where is the NRA? Uh, you know. It's like, well, they, you know, so many people say, well, it's Massachusetts. You're never going to win. Right. Well, if you throw in the towel and say, we can't win, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're not going to win. Yep. You can't, like they say about the lottery, you can't win if you don't play. Yep. So we're here to play. We're here to play the game. We're here to get people fired up. There's a lot of angry uh, g gun owners out there. They're saying, listen, here's the, the, the narrative that they put forth. And it's, it's pretty disgusting if you look at some of the things they do. 
The narrative they put forth is that, and we've heard it repeated, repeatedly, we've heard it. Our strong gun laws in Massachusetts reduce gun violence. Um, they actually don't. We've had a rise in gun violence over the last three years. Um, the ERPO bill did what for the three police officers that have been murdered over the last few years? Uh, it really, you know, it gets in my craw, as they say, when a politician says, our hearts go out to the family of the fallen officer. The fallen officer? No. The officer was murdered by a depraved individual that your system, that you run with your judges, coddles. A multiple convicted felon, criminal, well, lifelong the, criminal. The last three police officers that have been murdered in cold blood. I mean, this, this latest one is probably the worst. What, what, what transpired is the worst of all of them so far. Um, I see the support. The, the media loves to cover it. Look at the support pouring out for the fallen officer. God, I wish that after these police officers were done escorting his body to or from the medical examiner, that they take all those cruises and they take a ride by the judge's house and just park there for a while and let them know we've had enough. The 86-year-old lady that got murdered as well. Well, you're aging her. She was only 77. But. Oh, so, oh, I heard 86 on the news today. Uh, 77. Oh, well, 77 is uh, what they said the other morning. No, that's a spring chicken. She's, like, mentioned as, like, a footnote in the news. She was looking out the window of her, of her porch. Yep. They showed the bullet hole through the, the porch window. Unbelievable. Sitting there drinking coffee. She's looking outside going, what's going on? And this guy goes, bang, bang. Just a, a, a belligerent thing. Um, so that's that's where you're at with with this sort of stuff. It's it's John oh. Lott. Have you ever heard of John Lott? I don't think so. So John Lott uh, is a professor, an economics professor of all things. And many years ago, eh, it might be ten or ten or twenty years ago. I don't know. He decided as a research project because, you know, all these violence has an economic impact on the community. Mm -hmm. So he looked at gun violence and he was trying to figure out what effect laws have on violence um, and what's the economic impact on a society. So he went into the study assuming that where the gun laws were more lax, where there was more freedom, where the laws were more liberal, liberal meaning uh, the, the classic meaning of liberal, not today's meaning of liberal where they want to control everything, but the classic meaning of liberal where, hey, you know, you've never been con convicted of a felony. That's the only bar you have to pass, mm -hmm. like constitutional carry, to own a firearm, to carry a firearm. He assumed that with more liberal or freer access to firearms to law-abiding citizens that crime rates would be higher. And he was surprised to find out that just the opposite is true. That the stricter the gun laws are, the more, uh, the more difficult, more expensive it is for a law-abiding citizen to possess and use a firearm lawfully in self-defense the crime rates are higher because you're creating victims. You're mm -hmm. creating more unarmed citizens who can't protect themselves against criminals. And he was shocked to find that out, and he wrote a book about it, More Guns, Less Crime. It was one of the books he's written. Uh, his most recent book is The War on Guns. Now, uh, a gentleman funded him to come out um, to the Beacon Hill Institute, which is um, is part of what's the law school in Boston? A Suffolk School of Law. Yep. They have a building down below the State House on the other side of the Boston Common is one of their campus buildings and they brought John Lott out to speak and I went there to listen to his speech. Oh cool. And 
Not a single legislator was there. Not an attorney general. Not anyone from the attorney general's office. A few former board members of Goal. Uh, a couple of my friends that uh, I told it was going to be happening showed up. And it was an hour and a half lecture. I actually videotaped it. Um, but the most interesting part, which I have to cut out of the video at one point, is he explained that the, the progressives who say that they're for the poor and the downtrodden folks, they're the ones who pass all these very, very strict gun laws. And his studies in the Chicago area, on gun laws in the Chicago area, showed him that those laws actually hurt the people who are the most vulnerable. You know, someone who doesn't have a lot of money, he's living in the in city of Chicago, um, is a law-abiding citizen, but they live amongst a lot of bad people. The laws out there that um, you need, I believe it's uh, 12 hours of training. Now, nobody's going to do more than eight hours of training at once in a sitting because it's just physically too long. A lot of the folks in that area don't have cars. The local zoning, and, and they, they have to have live fire, the local zoning doesn't allow any training facilities in the city. So now a person has to take two days off from work. They have to borrow or rent a car to get outside the city many miles away for the training. That just getting to the training and taking the time from work to do that is a huge expense to these folks. Then the fees are very high as well. The classes cost a lot of money. The licensing fees cost a lot of money. And then they still have to travel outside the city to go and buy a lawful handgun. So he says the exact opposite is the result. That these people think they're protecting people by passing harsh gun laws when they're actually doing more harm than good in places like Chicago. So why do you think they don't listen? Uh, why? Because they're they're um, they're slaves to their ideology. It's pretty simple. They can't hear um, reason. They can't get beyond their feelings, which is you know their ideology, their mm -hmm. religion, is the leftist religion that guns are bad, um, and they can't they can't get beyond the truth. You know. Uh, uh, they, they can't listen to the truth, rather. They can't listen to the truth, and they, they can't leave their the ideology CDC by listening to the truth. If only the ever did a, 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 a survey on this. Uh, yeah, um, they did. They did? They did. They did it, and they did it in... Um, all, all the, all the they gun did grabbers said they, 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 there's laws against them doing that. No, 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 no. No? No, no, no. no, no there's more... So you go back to John Lott, and there's plenty of uh, gun uh, violence surveys that take place. A lot of them are funded by guys like Michael Bloomberg. Ooh. So if somebody comes to you and says, Richard, here, I need you to do a gun survey for oh, me. Here's $400,000. Do the survey. Do it at Qu uh, Quinnipiac University or somewhere. Um, and you, you, you know I'll be happy with the results, right? Oh, more than Because more than you, there's another 200000 in it for oh, you oh, when, oh, when the results oh, come oh, back. I'll, I'll, if it's a good survey. I'll make sure it's an excellent survey. That's one of the things that John Lott points out, is that um, these guys cherry-pick the data. He goes and looks at their surveys, looks at the raw data, and he goes, wait, they're, they're twisting the facts. Like they're saying children are killed uh, at this rate. And they've redefined what a child is, and they've brought it up to 26 years old. Because they said all of a sudden, since someone can be covered by uh, Obamacare until they're 26, then they're still a child. And they take all those deaths by handguns from the gangbangers, and they count those as gun deaths. They also take lawful shootings by police officers, lawful shootings by citizens in self-defense, and call those gun violence. So... They really take the data and, and, and they cherry pick it and recategorize it in ways that support their arguments. Uh, John Lott even points out at his lecture and in his books that even the FBI does it. Wow. Even the FBI changes the, the data. They cherry pick it the way they want to support whatever arguments they're trying to make. 
And he just takes the raw data, does it clean, so, you know, doesn't look at their filtering of the data. He gets the raw data uh, from the crime stats and, and calculates it in an honest manner. You know, you're no longer a child at 18, stuff like that. It uh, doesn't count uh, lawful shootings, lo shootings in self-defense, because that's not, that's not gun violence, right? Um, a lot of us being brought up um, in the politically correct world, we were taught the Ten Commandments when we went to church. But we were told, thou shalt not kill. Oh, that's not what Moses was given on the tablets. It was thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not murder. Big. Exactly. Big difference. It's a big difference. All right, we got another call coming in. Excellent. I'm going to do that. Do it right. Uh oh, lose them again. One second. Hello. Hello. Hey, you're on the air at the gun range. Thank you very much. Chris, how you doing, Chris? Good. How are you? Who's this? Chris, it's Alex Veras. How you doing? <laughs> Alex, how are you? I didn't get a chance All to right. shout you out yet. Alex is. Nah. Well, I want to. I want to thank you for what you're doing, but I want to tell you an experience I had with gold. You know, you know my struggle in getting the GOP, not that I want to make this a Republican thing, in reaching out to the well, let, let me interrupt you for yeah. a second here. Alex, Pardon? Alex formed a group called the Massachusetts Minority Republican Caucus. So he's trying to get um, Republican values um, mm -hmm. instilled in the inner city and get, and get more minorities. Wow. Excellent. Uh, yeah. So... Excellent. Thank you for what you're doing as well, yeah, Alex. Thank you. Yep. No, not a problem. Thanks. I mean, I had a talking with the guy from Gold there, who lives two towns over from me in Newburyport. And I told him, you know, there, there may be a couple guys that are veterans, you know. Let's, let's organize. Let's do a plan. Let's talk to, you know, business owners in the Hispanic community, black community, whatever. Let us be the guys that can go out there and talk because gun rights. Believe me, you don't want to tell one third of the state's population doesn't matter when it comes to gun rights. You know what he said? Nah, it's not important. So yeah, <laughs> you know the you know, go as much as they like to talk about gun owners, much like the mass GOP doesn't want to talk to people who look like me, who have served this country, who has family that owns businesses, who are the direct victims of this crime that's happening, and yet they don't want to do anything. To come into the public and say, look, the Second Amendment applies to you as well. Whether you're born here, whether you're an immigrant and you became a citizen, the Second Amendment applies to you. It is your God-given right to protect your home, family, and business. Yet goal refuses to do it. Ut utterly amazing. Yeah, um, so you make a good point there. The Second Amendment is a God-given right. Mm -hmm. If you read it literally as it's written, it is actually a restraint on the government. It's not granting us rights. It, the Founding Fathers acknowledged in the Constitution and in the Federalist Papers that there are certain rights that we automatically have, whether there's a government or not, whether you believe in God or not. I mean, I always give the logic of, um, you know, you can say something's a sin or it's just morally wrong. You don't necessarily have to believe in a, in a higher being to understand that um, in, in Jewish law, it is a sin. In fact, a lot of our legal law in, uh, in our country comes, it, it, it emanated from Jewish law, like um, mal, um, negligence, okay? So in, in, in Jewish law, if you see a crazed cow running towards the village where there's lots of people gathered, and you don't warn your community, that's, that's negligence to a certain point. It's, yeah. it's, it's a, a, a lighter form of negligence. You're even more negligent if it was your cow and you didn't do something about the cow. But there, in, um, in the Bibles, Old and New Testaments, they talk about these things. They, they say it's a sin if someone attacks you your sister, your mother, your daughter, your brother, your father, your aunt, your uncle, and you don't defend yourself. That's a sin. And that's where self-defense law comes from. 
And this is, you know, you're That's expected. Very interesting. You're, the, you're expected as a, as a human being, as a member of a community, as someone that dwells on this earth, that's civilized, that if someone's being attacked, you should, if you're capable, come to their aid. You know, and, and I don't want to get all religious on you here, but you got to understand this is history, right? These are historic books where things come from. So I'm not trying to bump a Bible here, but in the uh, New Testament, when Jesus Christ knew that his time was done with the transgressors, that he was going to die. You know, he was going to sacrifice himself for the sins. He Forget about self-defense. It was meant to be. That was his destiny that he was going to die on the cross. But he looked at his um, apostles, and he told them, if you don't have a sword and a shield, then sell your cloak, give up your purse, you know, your coins, and get one. Because it's your responsibility to protect yourself. Well, and Chris, if, if anybody's more appreciative in this, in our state, of the fact that you have the right to defend yourselves, it's people like my family. I'm only one generation removed from, from a military dictatorship. Most of the people in my neighborhood in Haverhill have, in one way or another, either themselves or their parents, grown up under a brutal military dictatorship. It's in the, in Vietnam, the, the, yep, Russia. Latin America. Yeah. And I appreciate the fact that they could defend themselves. And these are the people that we're not talking to that we need to reach out and say, it is your God given right to defend yourself. Because, you know, I look at my uncle, my, one of my mom's younger brothers, and this was during the era of Trujillo, who was a dictator of the Dominican Republic for 31, 31 years. And my uncle made the mistake that when Trujillo's secret police came over and said, who runs this house? And he said, Daddy, and my maternal grandfather got the you-know-what kicked out of him. Well, you know, if my maternal grandfather had a gun, they wouldn't have done that. No, it's true. You, you know? Yep. It is so important to protect yourself because government that gives you is government that will take from you. Absolutely. And there are people like myself who are middle class, Hispanic, or whatever, understand that. Those who are on the bill, they don't get it, and they will always be slaves to the government. But those of us who work and earn a living understand that the unfortunate aspect a lot of us like other people are packing up and going to states where gun rights aren't sure i mean i, I talked to my cousins in florida I, I could buy this i could buy that i couldn't buy that in massachusetts so so tell me what what's your point of view as far as getting that point across to all these people who in their lifetime has never seen anything bad because they've been insulated and protected and either live in a good community or right next to a police station or something, and they all say, oh, well, that's not going to happen to me. And, and what, how can we deliver that message that this stuff actually happens and that we need to protect ourselves? Go on their shows. Yeah. Access, you know, you have a very active minority media, be it Brazilian, Hispanic, you know, or Asian. Reach out to them. They're looking for stuff to fill the papers. They're looking for stuff to fill their, their radio shows. Yeah, I guarantee I probably don't speak two of those languages. You know, I don't I don't speak Mandarin Chinese. But go on. I'll tell you what, my last student just this past weekend pretty much only spoke Mandarin. And her her daughter Wait, as a firearms instructor? Yeah. You were teaching someone that didn't speak any English. Yeah. And how hard how hard was that? Well, um, she spoke a little, yep. and, and thankfully her daughter came along, who I trained as well, who could translate a lot of the, um, the nuances of what I was trying to say yep. or what have you. I asked because I got a friend who's married to a Chinese woman, and her brother and a bunch of his friends want to come over here to do some hunting on a game ranch. Oh, cool. It's like, how am I going to instruct these guys? In gun safety before we get them out on the, on the, uh, I, I, on the range. I think that... Um, I think I'm going to call you up. Yeah, but right. I think it's... A, it, it, it's safety is a, is, is a common language we yep. all speak. Yep. And um, even through different languages and ethnicities, without uttering a word, we, we can communicate, especially firearms enthusiasts. Yeah. 
and uh, it, it, but it was a wonderful experience for me. And um, I've trained. Did deaf she apply people. for her license now? Um, I'm getting her a certificate this week, and yeah. hopefully within the next uh, within the week or so, her and her daughter will be getting uh, applying for their license. It's good. an exciting Very thing, good. you know. There's a group. Of, there's a group in Lawrence right now. Can't think of the name of the guy. I have to find him. And their emphasis is to go out in Lawrence and teach gun safety. And I believe they have a gun, a gun club in Lawrence. Excellent. I think everybody, every firearms owner in this state should take a liberal friend to the range. Pick a day and just pick your co-worker, a family member who who's sitting on that fence or who is his actually on the other side of the fence, dug in deep. If you bring that person to the range and just say, hey, give me a half an hour of your time. If you can't give me a half an hour of your time to show you my passion, my belief in this, then your argument about taking away my right is mute. Yeah. You know? Just give me a half an hour. And so let me just show you. Well, yeah, let's let's talk about that part a little bit more because they've got this false okay, narrative. They gotta go. All they right, thank you for calling, Alex. Thank you Appreciate very much, it. and thank you for your service to this doing. country. Behave, Alex. I will. Thank you. So the fa the false narrative again is that these gun laws fix things. Okay, mm. remember the bump stock ban? Yeah. Somebody used the, allegedly used the bump stock. Because there were recordings of the shooting in Las Vegas, and uh, audio analysis of it said it was a M240 machine gun or M420, whatever. I don't know machine guns very well. They did audio analysis of it, military guys, and they said that's no bump stock. That's an M240 machine gun. Well, that whole situation smells like a dead fish anyway. Yeah. So, you know, another thing, all of a sudden we got to ban bump stocks everywhere. Now, bump stocks are they're a novelty item. They're really not that reliable. They don't shoot the way everyone thinks they do. And they're really hard to use. They're very hard to use. You can't just go buy one and all of a sudden you got a you know, fully automatic gun. You're not running around like Rambo shooting up everything. That's yeah. for sure. And But this state within they were, a week? Yeah, it didn't a take them half. Long. Boom. They're didn't didn't outlawed. Long. Just like that. They're outlawed. And uh, life in prison for owning a piece of plastic. A piece of plastic that was originally designed to assist handicapped people with shooting rifles. Yep. That's what it was designed Isn't for. that a crying shame? A knee-jerk reaction. A knee-jerk reaction. And then they said uh, it can uh, be up to a life sentence in jail for owning a piece of plastic. Not committing like a real crime against somebody. Just owning it. Just owning for it. a week, a week before, and then it they was sent demand legal. letters out to every single gun owner in Massachusetts, threatening demand letters from uh, Department of Public Safety guy uh, Bennett, who is involved in his own scandals with uh, uh, withholding or fabricating evidence in a court case. Excellent. Yep, and cost the state somewhere around. Two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars to send out these demand letters. Cost the state. You mean cost us? Well, yeah, cost us the taxpayer. Thank you, thank you for correcting me. Cost us the taxpayers quarter of a million dollars to send out these threatening letters, and the last count was three bump stocks and one trigger crank. They got them all. Thank God. Yeah. I don't think they got them all. I don't think they got them all. I think I know a few people that have more than that in their own personal collection. And they said the government can't do this. The government cannot demand your private property with no compensation because you were told to turn this bump stock in. Some of them cost like $140. Some of them, the nicer models, could cost up to $200, $240. And people just said, no, we're not doing it. So there were three fools that gave up their bump stocks for free, and one guy gave up a trigger crank. And I don't know what those are worth, maybe 50, 60 bucks. Uh, I've never had the need for a tr trigger crank, just like Charlie Baker's never had the need for a gun. I, I, I'm just amazed. Uh, I, I, I had the chance, the opportunity to meet 
Mr. Baker. <clears throat> I was in the same room with him. Um, you couldn't you couldn't throw a cotton ball without hitting an armed guard for a Secret Service person in that room. That must have been armed to the tooth. Um, Where was this? It was a little get together uh, right down the street at one of the golf courses. Um, and you just happened to be there? Uh, well, I, I was there to support somebody else. Oh, okay. Right. And uh, I looked over at uh, Mr. Baker, and because uh, I can't call him my governor, and uh, I had no enthusiasm to, at all to even go up to him or say anything to him. I'm, give me another shrimp instead, and uh, I'm here to support somebody else. And yep, I just well, he certainly hasn't been supporting our rights. When Mar Healy pulled her stunt July 20th of 2016, he did nothing. He stood mute. Oh, oh no, he supported her, actually. He said it's within her office to do this. So he basically said... No due said, process, but the office can, is allowed to do it. Mm. Mm, someone needs to buy them a dictionary. Um... Uh, yeah, so our governor is, uh, he's, uh, some people call him a rhino, but he's a, he's a full, full-blown progressive. And let's remember, he took over $500,000 for his causes from Michael Bloomberg and John Rosenthal. Just a day or two before. So him. don't be shocked if, if, and I hope he doesn't, gets reelected and he, they push more gun bills on you. The rumor is that next legislative season they're going for Deval Pat. They're going to revive a old Deval Patrick uh, bill, one gun a month. That's what's coming next legislative season. This is why you should get your free sticker, MassGunRights.com. Click on free sticker, get your free sticker, get on our lists, join the fight. Um, and MassGunGiveaway.com, sign up to win a free six-hour awesome. P320C, the compact version, 9 millimeter, night sights, a holster, and two mags. And um, i got to thank Dean Shannon and the guys at Continental Firearms in Clinton because they're helping us run the gun giveaways now. Awesome. We've gotten busy with so much stuff. We were always hoping somebody would come along and want to help us out. And I met Dean, and he said, how can I help? I'm like, well, you own a gun shop, so you can just pick the firearms and do the drawings and all that, and that'll be so much stuff that we don't have to do. Excellent. You know, And we can just get the firearms from you, and you just handle the whole thing. Hopefully they'll be um, Facebook Live in the drawing. When the drawing nice. time comes, it's called the Independence Gun Giveaway. Um, and if you enter that gun giveaway and donate to help our cause, um, $25 or more, we'll send you a free T-shirt with the sticker awesome. the logo on it. I'm always up for another free T-shirt. There you go. <laughs> well, so that's uh, that's kind of what's going on, and we're gonna we're gonna work hard for this coming election. And you're always looking for volunteers, right? Volunteers are good. Um, there are some groups that help out. So there are some groups that help out candidates by recruiting door knockers, and the door knockers get paid. It's a good good job for like mm. young kids. I think it ranges depending on who's funding them, and we can't fund them ourselves. Um, 501c4, that would be electioneering if we're paying somebody to knock doors to get a candidate elected. But we can tell you where to go. We can connect people that want to help as activists with campaigns that are pro 2A. Mm -hmm. And those guys actually get, the, the door knockers get paid. And if you drive, you get paid a little more. Nice. So I think it's maybe like 50 or 60 bucks for a door knocker or 70 and 75 to 90, depending on the number of hours for the drivers. Um, some guys have done it that were, were volunteers through our group. Mm -hmm. We sent them to some campaigns. A guy went out with his kids, his young kids who are nice. learning to shoot, and they went door knocking, and he told the kids, hey, we're helping this candidate because this candidate is pro-2A. This candidate's been vetted. They're good guys. 
and they're going to fight for us on Beacon Hill. And we're going to, you know, our plan is to add some more and awesome. deliver some punishment on some of the antis um, as well. We'll publish votes. Uh, votes will be published leading into the election. So you know how people voted. We had some shockers on the ERPO bill where Republicans that had been stalwarts with us had always been pro 2A voters flipped. They flipped on us. And they bought into this baloney that if they didn't vote for ERPO, then they'd have to explain it to their voters. Why? How could you not want to take guns away from someone who their family thinks they're crazy? Well, here's the problem with ERPO. And the problem has always existed, and they know it exists. There's a thing called a 209A restraining order. Yep. All right? And you probably heard the same stories I had from guys. A woman is getting divorced from her husband. She has kids. She lived, they're living in a house together that they own or they have a mortgage on. And now she wants a divorce. She goes to her divorce lawyer and says, I don't know what to do. Am I going to get kicked out of the house? What am I going to do with my kids? And the divorce lawyers, lawyers, the operative word, not being all that honest all the time, tells the woman, when you serve him with the papers, if he gets upset, now it's probably expected if a guy married a woman, going to spend the rest of his life with her, his expectations, he had kids with her, he works hard to support those kids, and now all of a sudden she wants a divorce. He might get upset. You just need to go down to the court the next day and say, your husband got really upset when you served him with papers, and now you fear that he might harm you. You get a restraining order. He gets kicked out of the house. Because if he's out of the house, it's going to be that much easier for us to get the house and the divorce. Now, Richard, what happens when a 209A restraining order is filed on you? You lose them all. You lose your gun rights. Yep. So, the claim on Beacon Hill was that... Permanently. There is due pro... Here, I, I, uh, Natalie Higgins from Lemonster told a constituent in, in an email, and he forwarded it to me, that... There is due process protections in the ERPO bill. You get the same due process protections as in a 209A restraining order. He responded to that her and said, feel good that's exactly up. why I'm worried about this bill. No kidding. Because someone just has to make an accusation, doesn't have to be proof, and it just has to be how they feel. Richard, you just looked at me funny. I feel, I feel afraid of you right now. Uh-oh. Um, I've got to lock up my guns. They're going to come for him. I'm going to go tell the chief. I'm going to go in front of a judge and say, the way you just looked at me, uh, with uh, contempt like that, I, 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 f I feel you. And I know, you're a, I know you're a gun owner. So I want, I want his guns taken away. Cause Does he, this mean we're getting a divorce? No. Oh, okay. No, no we're good. <laughs> no, but they, all they did was expand that same abuse of the laws, and they said, oh, um, if someone knowingly falsely reports something like this, they could be subject to a $2,500 to $5,000 fine. When has that ever happened? I, I, I don't see any judge in the Commonwealth fining someone for playing itself. And, you know, the um, if you see something, say something, things that goes on all the time, um, that is what caused a veteran in New Jersey to have the police arrive at his house because his 13-year-old son was at school discussing lax school safety. Probably this kid knows from talking to his parents that if you don't have cops or someone with a gun at a school, it's a soft target likely to be attacked. Yep. And the easiest way to defend that school is to have somebody there who can defend the school a with good, force. A good, well-trained person. With force. Yep. That alone will be a deterrent. Um, the um, and some lieutenant, to, to lieutenant Colonel house. Dave Grossman, you ever heard of him? Yep. On 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 combat and in battle, mm -hmm. he's he's an expert on terrorism. 
And he basically says, you have to harden the targets. Because there's one thing that's common among people that reign terror, whether it be a school shooter or a jihadi uh, that's, you know, bringing jihad against them, is they're all cowards. They pick soft targets. Yep. And all you have to do is harden the target, just like you harden a bank, just like you harden that, that 50 bodyguards that Charlie Baker had around them, right? All that sort of stuff. Why can Charlie Baker say guns in schools are a bad idea? Wait, Charlie, you're a hypocrite. you got 50 armed guards around you. If you think that guns are bad, then give up your bodyguards. Right. Oh. Okay, give up your bodyguards. Why do you get protection? Those 50 bodyguards could be working at 50 schools. Now it would be 50 fewer schools that would be susceptible to an attack. Yep. Because they'd be hard targets and less likely to happen. We've had shootings happen in schools where there's a school resource officer present and he hears a one gunshot go off and he runs towards it. Not like those folks dad down in Parkland where they ran away from the shots, the cops in Parkland. <sighs> he runs towards it, and I believe it was South Carolina. He runs towards it and that's it. He stopped the threat. Stopped the threat immediately. And no kids got hurt. Well, one girl got uh, wounded, well, yeah, well, but she did yeah. not die. Yep. But he heard that first gunshot go off, and he ran towards it. Done. And Over they, with. And there's multiple uh, stories of that happening in other places where so, a resource officer was there. A bright young 13-year-old discusses this at school. Some mother overhears it. She tells the school. The school tells the state police. The state police shows up at the guy's house. They want his guns. He's like, no. No due process. You've had no warrant. You can't have my guns. And he said, listen, if it'll make you feel better, I'll move the guns outside the house. If you think there's a threat because my son might have access to them, I'll, I'll move them. He moved them. He protected his rights by standing up and saying no. Good for him. And that's what we need to do here in Massachusetts at election time. We need to get informed as to who's right and who's wrong on these issues and make sure that we get out and vote. Educate yourself. Educate the liberals in your life. Go out and volunteer. Oh, and progressive gun grabber Charlie Baker has an opponent. Who's running against Charlie today? This year. There's a guy that when I was waiting to come on the air with you, you had him on a, on your show here. A guy named Scott Lively, who is very pro-gun, constitutional lawyer, and believes that this stuff that's going on in the state is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Very pro-gun. I can't tell you to vote for him because I'm a 501c4. Yep. But I can tell you, Charlie takes money from the gun grabbers. Scott Lively will never do that. He's pro-gun. And then, you know, we've got some guys. I've got a guy running against Mara Healy as well. Awesome. Who's that real quick? A guy named Jay McMahon. He's very, very pro-gun. He said on his first day in office he'll get rid of that uh, so-called assault weapons ban. The oh, DOJ God. just came out a couple weeks ago and said AR-15s are not military weapons. They just came out and said they're not military weapons. One of the excuses that Mara Healy used for taking them away, she claimed they were military weapons. And we, we can talk about that in another show. We, we have tons of stuff we could talk about. But thank you very much for tuning in. Everybody have a great and safe week. Always keep one in the pipe and have a wonderful week. Take care, everybody.